Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Programs broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Thursday, September 7th, 2023. Tonight's broadcast is on PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I'm going to be talking about stress and trauma in general and the process that, that facilitates healing or moving through stressful events, moving through traumatic events, and the effect that it has in our lives based on duration, when it happens, and so forth. So First of all, I, I want to define what PTSD is according to the diagnostic manual. I love this quote before that that says PTSD is in part a tortured conscience, the tortured conscience of good people who did their best under the conditions that would dehumanize anybody. One of the messages that you're going to hear tonight, and, and this relates to the trauma that your child feels and, and how they define it is, is our response to it becomes the predictor for how severe the PTSD can be. In other words, the kind of space, the container, the, the facilitation, if you will, about how we cope with and deal with somebody else's stress and trauma has an impact on the severity of the disorder, the severity of the symptomology and its duration. So first of all, there has to be exposure to uh, a traumatic event. I wrote dramatic, but I mean traumatic. The exposure to a traumatic event and the reason why that's important is because you don't get to define what somebody else's trauma is. I think one of the biggest difficulties for most parents who are engaged in this process of getting their child treatment and finding ways to support themselves throughout the process is that their perspective, their viewpoint on the trauma is the lens through which they see the entire thing. You, you have to see the events through the person's eyes. And so the person who gets to define trauma is not somebody else and definitely not the person who may have done the, the, the denting or the exposure themselves, but it's defined by the individual. That is a core principle. If, a, if, a, if an individual or a child is not allowed to define, doesn't get heard, doesn't get that, that space, if you will, held for them around an event that they deemed traumatic, you will see the symptomology increase. In other words, the symptoms become the voice that doesn't get heard in this entire process. So there has to be exposure to an event, but you don't get to decide it. And I want to say this to all parents listening, and this goes for partners and anybody else also, but specifically to parents. The fact of the matter is you will, as your child goes through treatment, you will hear or, or read reports from them, their self reports about what happened in their life as it relates to you. And inevitably, you will not see the same things that they do. You'll not see things the same way that they do. You'll think to yourself, they are telling somebody else's story, somebody else's history, or they're using it as an excuse for, for bad behavior, for maladaptive behavior. But I will assure you that from their perspective, their definition description of events is their, their best attempt to give voice to feelings of unwellness, feelings of fear, feelings of anger, feelings of pain, feelings of powerlessness. So I've, I've been on the other end. I, I've, I've sat by and watched children and parents go through this process where a child says, growing up, this happened to me or that happened to me, even being sent to a program, being defined by the child as traumatic. And I've heard parents and adults say around them that didn't happen at all. But in a way, you can think about a child's self-report similar to the way that you would hear about somebody describing a dream that they had the night before. We know that the, that the events in dreams, the, the, the scene and the story, the narrative uh, of a dream isn't accurate on one level. It's usually madness and craziness, incoherent and strange. But we also know that dreams are the most honest report of somebody's distress or somebody's what's going on, what, what process they're experiencing in their life. So we learn to listen to others as if they are telling us about their dreams. We don't confront the inaccuracies, at least not initially. That can happen later on once safety has been established. And that will come much, much later than most people are comfortable with, even therapists. But you, you don't get to decide your interpretation generally speaking, can, can, can only harm the, the, the child's healing, can only harm the other person's processing and integration of the experience. 
With post-traumatic stress disorder, there is, and, and this is probably the most common experience that people have in, in understanding PTSD, is that there's a persistent re-experiencing of the event. The most classic example is somebody who is a, is a war veteran will experience the backfire of a car, although we don't hear backfires anymore very often, but hear a loud bang and they'll hit the ground. They'll, they'll, they'll even tackle the people around them and bring them, bring them to the ground because they have that experience where that kind of a sound is consistent with a, a severe life threat to those and, and, and those around them, to them and those around them. And so the reaction is instantaneous, a persistent re-experiencing of the trauma. There's also a persistent avoidance or emotional num numbing that's often common with PTSD. Escapism, looking to, to, to not feel, to either feel nothing or feel something relieving. Drugs have that, that, that use for them. Uh, game addiction has that use for it. And it doesn't have to be things that are just thought of as toxic or unhealthy. You can escape from it mentally. You can ignore what you're feeling, develop a Pollyannish superficial attitude around things. And in that way, you're numbing yourself. It's ignoring and, and, and running away from the feelings that, that are coming up for you. So there's a, there's a numbing and avoidance that comes with that. And of course, there's, a, there's an increase in symptoms and issues that were not present before the trauma. Right? We, we, that's an important just definition of it. The duration has to last more than one moment, one, one month, excuse me. The duration has to, to last more than one month. And most importantly, there's significant impairment on the part of the individual suffering from PTSD. It's affecting their, their social life, their intellectual academic life, their career life, their, 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 their physical health, their spiritual health. One or more of these areas is impaired. There's a new thought that's coming out. The, the, the diagnostic manual that's used internationally talks about complex PTSD or C PTSD. The additional features of complex PTSD, which I think of more generally just associated with trauma, is that there's a problem with affect regulation, meaning that there's a marked uh, irritability or anger or feeling emotionally numb. People's reactions don't seem consistent or commensurate with the outside experience. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. Secondly, there's a belief about oneself that becomes negative, diminished. Feelings of, of defeatedness or, or worthlessness accompanied by feelings of shame, guilt, or failure related to the trauma event. I could have stopped the abuse. Maybe I couldn't save the people in my company in war, my, my platoon, my, my, my group. There's this over blame, over responsibility. And this is interesting because one of the most common features, this is a really important point as it relates to treatment, especially as a parent who's watching a child go through a treatment process. One of the central features of trauma is a feeling of powerlessness, of being out of control, of not being able to maintain one's sense of safety. And the reason that that's so important is this, this is, this is really interesting is that as a therapist who, who's trauma informed, who understands PTSD, you walk a, a delicate balance between encouraging, fostering the healing process, but, but, but at the same time, not taking away the, the client's, uh, sense of initiation, the client's sense of their own control over it. So if you know somebody was abused and you, you, you know that they're suffering from PTSD and you come in hot, you come in strong and you start doing things to, to individuals to try to get them to be healed, you will recreate the trauma. And I will tell you this early in my career, I was guilty of this on, on many examples. I, I saw children, individuals suffering. I could even identify in some cases the specific event that, that led to the PTSD. And so I came in thinking I knew what was best and I was going to help them. You have to write a letter to, to the person that you're accusing. You have to talk about it in a group setting. You have to tell your parents about it. In, in all of those examples, I was in control. 
and that that external control or that lack of, of internal of a sense of internal control from the client feels like the trauma itself. It's it begins to approximate the trauma that the person suffered from originally. So you're walking a delicate balance as a parent or a loved one of somebody that's struggling, who's in treatment, who has dangerous and damaging symptoms to them, with themselves that they're displaying, we can become impatient in the process. And so that process of encouraging and facilitating and supporting somebody to heal their trauma has to be balanced in a very artistic and nuanced way with still giving the person permission to, to gatekeep their own healing, their own discussion and process. And then finally, difficulties in sustaining relationships and in feeling close to others. It's not just a numbness and a volatility as it relates to outside circumstances, but those kinds of, of feelings, behaviors, attitudes create a, a block toward other people. Even in therapy, sometimes when you hear somebody talking and you find your, your mind wandering or you find yourself bored or sleepy, first of all, you have to make sure that nothing's going on in your personal life that would contribute to those feelings. But if you walk into the session very clear, what you can begin to, to imagine or to ask yourself, get curious about is, I wonder if the reason that I'm feeling distracted, for lack of a better catch-all phrase, catch-all term, the reason that I'm feeling distracted is because I'm not really getting the authentic client in this situation. They, they are distracted. And when a client isn't being real and authentic, it's easy to get bored or distracted. Conversely, and this is much easier to recognize, when somebody shows up with an authentic truth, especially an authentic truth that might be unpopular or, or difficult to hear for the therapist or for the parent or for the individual that's listening, when they come into the conversation with difficult things to say for the other person, when they tell their, their, their secrets, their truth, their history, their, their, their shameful feelings and thoughts or experiences, it is absolutely compelling. When the authentic self shows up, you are all in, you are alert, you are focused. Listening is, is not a, a, a difficult process. It's something that, that happens in a very, very powerful way. Like I described earlier, this is really important. Any, an, an event or experience that overwhelms a person's ability to cope or integrate the ideas and emotions involved with that experience with potential repetitive responses of isolation, hypervigilance and self-destructive behaviors as adaptive co coping. A person's fundamental sense of safety is threatened. Factors that lead to the severity of the diagnosis or the impairment are of course intensity. How overwhelming was that one event or multiple events? The duration, how long did it last? Did it last years? Did it last months? Did it last moments? or seconds stage of life, what stage, because the human brain, and, and this is something, you know, all of that, that popular talk out there about how we, we, we treat children with, with kid gloves, so to speak, right? We, we give them participation trophies and, and a lot of people are, are critical uh, of that idea. What those folks are missing, what those folks are missing is that children aren't little adults. They're not simply little people. They are developmentally a, a different animal. And in each section of life, at each, at each phase of life, they're, they're processing and working on different tasks for themselves. The two-year-old, of course, the, the terrible twos, is working on a, a sense of individuation that we call autonomy. They're, they're starting to experiment with no, with separateness, with the ability to, to stand up to the big people. Adolescence, of course, the, the, the area, the, the developmental phase that we're most concerned about in our program, you're most concerned about as it relates to your child, is about individuation on, on another level. In fact, that happens three times. Two, teenage life, and then middle age. Those are the three times in our life that we're looking for a self-definition. And it becomes, of course, more and more complex as we age. I don't find it 
it's simply a coincidence. I think there's there's some beauty in, in the organization of the human family, the human species, that many parents of teens are around the midlife age. And so they're going through the same tasks together. The adolescent is looking to, to push away, to differentiate, to separate. We understand from, from the history of our species, if an adolescent doesn't separate or differentiate, doesn't stand on their own two feet, they're at risk of not surviving, they're at risk of dying. They have to eventually support themselves. And historically, since humans have been on this planet, historically, if they don't do that around that age, the test is coming real soon because not many people historically over, over the, 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 the large part of human history lived past the age of 40 or 50. So there was nobody there to take care of them. They literally had to sink or swim at that point. So when it happens affects the specific developmental stage that they're at. The invasiveness of the experience. Is it something that happens for example, a loud explosion or a fire, or is it something that's very personal like sexual abuse or, or physical abuse or emotional abuse for that matter? That level of intrusion becomes predictor. It's, it's similar to the idea of intensity. How much shame is around it? There's a lot more shame, for example, around sexual abuse because of our, 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 social, our social context around sex. So people who've experienced sexual abuse, same sex sexual abuse, for example, tend to have layers and layers of shame on, on top of everything else that is going on for them. And that is why the more recent movement in our, in our culture around mental health and mental illness and therapy is such a positive step forward. And then of course, resiliency factors. One of the things that's important to understand is that when somebody tells a story about their life, when somebody talks about their childhood, for example, they're telling a story that, that is a crystallization often of an experience. And what I mean by that is if it was a one-off, if you had very capable parents who were very grounded, not anxious, not themselves still dealing with unhealed trauma, capable of, of being there for the child, of tolerating very difficult emotions and processes. If you have a parent that is like that, then the events that happen to you that could contribute or could cause the diagnosis that the experience of post-traumatic stress disorder, it is going to be minimized. In fact, it's true in so many different areas. Veterans of war who have certain kinds of attachments or qualities of attachments are more likely to experience PTSD. There's even research that shows that after surgery, people with fractured and poor attachments require more pain medication. The, the, the attachment is, in essence, the resiliency. How well a child is seen and heard and supported is the greatest contribution to resiliency. So when somebody tells me about a, a story from childhood, even my own children, they're telling me about an event, but they're really telling me about what it felt like as a child during that period of time, in essence. You've heard the term big T and little T. Now I'm getting into trauma more generally. Big T traumas are the more obvious ones, like sexual abuse, like I've mentioned, death of a loved one, a parent in young life. You know, any, anything you can imagine that, that if you heard the story, you would immediately assume that experience, person experienced trauma. And then there's something called little t trauma. This is a very, very colloquial term, but, but broadly talked about, broadly accepted. Little t is more subtle. Little t is the process around the event. Little t is not just being bullied, because that could be thought of as a big T, but, but when a child is complain, complaining to a parent or a teacher, an authority figure about being bullied, they are dismissed. They are gaslit in today's modern, modern language. They aren't heard, they aren't held, they aren't supported in the process. The most difficult thing with little t trauma, which is absolutely common, the most difficult thing about it is there's often no story to tell. And that is why sometimes when people report a big t trauma that you could say, I don't think that happened. I've heard my children tell stories about their childhood. 
that 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 when listening, I've said to myself, I was there. I might forget some details. I might have some memories that aren't as vivid as other, but that didn't, that's not 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 what happened during that period. Sometimes the reporting of the big T trauma is really the story of a small T trauma. That's why I've talked about lately that when parents talk about could something like sending your child to treatment cause them PTSD? My response is if it's good treatment, ideally, no, of course not. But if the child doesn't get heard and understood, if they're not allowed to feel their anger, their hurt, their powerlessness, because the parent or, or the authority figure's ego is so fragile that they just can't allow for it because they can't see themselves as having made a decision that hurt the child, that upset the child. If that process is present, the child, the individual is likely to stay stuck in repetitive cycles and to develop more and more symptomology. The attachment is the key. The attunement is the key. The ability to see and listen and hear the child is the key. And the foundation of our ability to do all of those things I just described is how well we've sorted out our own life, our own childhood, our own small and big T traumas and everything in between. The research on this point is exhaustive. And I refer often to Daniel Siegel and Mary Hartzell's book, Parenting from the Inside Out. If you wanna to go to a place that explains what I've just described and cites the research in many, many instances. Trauma, you don't get to define, like I said, you don't get to define the trauma in someone else's life. They do. I, I remember learning this early on as a therapist because I had children come to our program. They would tell me stories about the parents. And I thought in those early days, I was supposed to be a detective or a mystic with some crystal ball that I could look into the past or through investigation, I could discover the truth and, and the story. And then I realized that that approach is actually part of the problem. That I listened to the child's story without judgment, almost with no opinion about it, about its, its, its truthfulness or its accuracy. And when I do that, the child tends to move through it. When parents do that, the child moves through the feelings more quickly, integrates them. The feelings go away. And when parents, individuals, therapists, loved ones can't hear feelings, try to talk them out of it, debate it, try to arrive at some objective consensus about what really happened, the individual, in this case, the child, will often stay stuck in the feeling and the feeling will become more and more severe, more and more exaggerated, and it will be the root of more and more symptoms. I love a definition that I heard a trauma specialist give one time at a conference I was attending. She said, Trauma can be defined as anything less than ideal. I love that idea. Anything less than ideal. ideal. And, and, and by that definition, every human, every human being has experienced some trauma. I describe the risks of re-traumatizing with, with what Jamie Gill calls good abuse. She says, thus, if the therapist or guide knows what is right for us and manip manipulates us to achieve these treatment goals, it is abuse, plain and simple. It is hard to see how good abuse ever cures bad abuse. So the therapist must be patient. The therapist must use the art of therapy. They must create a safe space. Young therapists, and, and I have to tell you, many therapists never grow out of this. In fact, I would argue the, the, the vast majority, by, by a large margin, never grow out of this. They think that the, the art of therapy is calling people on their defenses. You're justifying, you're rationalizing, you're making excuses. Those kinds of things can eventually be processed. That's true. But that has to be done in the context of a safe, trusting relationship and some autonomy, some sense of initiation, initiating needs to come from the individual who's the, 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 the sufferer of the trauma. Trauma is not what happened outside of us, but what happened inside of us, usually predicted by a lack of support or connection in and around the traumatic event. That's what I've been describing. 
the same two individuals can experience objectively speaking the same exact event on the outside but on the inside over time in their in their respective contexts it is a very different experience and that's the gold of tonight's broadcast really to understand that we have some contribution to the severity of the PTSD, the trauma, that the quality of our attachment is a mitigator. Before I even thought about any of this, when I was working on my dissertation in the 90s, we studied families that experienced trauma, divorce specifically, a very common trauma, and having at least one parent who, who's identified as an alcoholic or, or a problem drinker. And then we asked ourselves, was there anything that could mitigate those traumas? And we did, we, 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 we did many, many studies, many measures. And we found that it was just a couple of questions that if they were answered a certain way, were predictive of whether or not there were symptoms in young adulthood. And those questions surrounded the idea of did the child experience in and around the event a consistent adult in their life who saw them? If you don't know what it means when I say to see them, that's a really important thing to discover what I'm talking about. Attunement, capacity, holding space, not agreeing, not seeing things the same way that the, the child sees them, but actually allowing the child to sort it out and holding that, that container, if you will. If the child identified that there was somebody consistent in their life in and around the events who saw them, who was there for them, that was supportive, we could not tell the difference between that child and somebody who experienced no traumas, no reported traumas in those areas. Specifically, the outcome measure was uh, satisfaction in intimate relationships. Isn't that profound? And that was long before I thought about attachment theory, thought about attachment-based therapy or saw any of this. It just so happened that that's what my professor was interested in. So that's what I study. I love this quote right here. To me, this is, this is my favorite moment of tonight's broadcast. A bird sitting on a tree is never afraid of the branch breaking because her trust is not on the branch, but on its own wings. I love that quote. That's what attachment theory teaches us is that we walk around with an internal sense of safety. For years, I've heard therapists tell, outpatient therapists tell parents at home, give your child more space. Let them make choices. Stop trying to micromanage, control them, control the situation. And oftentimes parents would follow that guidance and then would end up in, in, a, in a boil of boiling water. They would end up in a really difficult place with some really difficult symptoms in their child. And what I want to tell those home therapists to say is, it's not that by doing this, by, by, by pulling back, by giving more choices, by not micromanaging, that you can guarantee that your child won't get hurt, won't struggle with substance use disorder, won't lie and get themselves into trouble or expose themselves to something traumatic. It doesn't guarantee that. But what it does do is it supports the development. And if you have this sense of attachment yourself that's described by this quote with the bird on the limb, you can handle it. You'll be able to deal with it. And I've had to relearn that with all of my children. My youngest, I've had to relearn that. And she's doing a great job of teaching me. Really, she is. Just a couple of years ago, I, I had to find myself in a situation where she was allowed to have a privilege to go somewhere, to do something. And I was worried about what could happen to her in this circumstance. Nothing overtly nefarious was going on, but I was in my anxiety. And I remember dropping her off with some friends at, a, at another friend's house and thinking to myself, it was around Halloween and thinking to myself, I'll be able to handle. I, I told myself, even if the thing that I most fear happening, ha happening happens, I can deal with that. And that's what this quote means. And that came out of my work. And when you have that sense that you, you trust your own wings, you don't try to control things. You can still have boundaries. Always, 
always you can still have boundaries. Please don't hear that anything I talk about, especially tonight, means that you can't have boundaries and limits and consequences and so forth. That's a, that's a responsibility that a parent carries and can't shirk. But in the end, there's a difference between having boundaries and trying to control for outcomes, gripping it tightly, trying to prevent anything bad from happening. That is a trauma response. Those are trauma responses. Those are evidences of our unhealed wounds. And children who struggle with the issues that our children struggle with, they are going to expose that lack of emotional development and healing in us inevitably. And so it's incumbent upon us to do our work in this process, always to do our work. So the resiliency factors are the processes in the family, how the family operates, how the family talks about feelings, how the family negotiates relationships. Does the family validate feelings? Does the family dismiss and gaslight feelings? And, and, and just so you know, just to give you a picture, virtually everybody gaslights their children. It is extraordinarily rare and almost never the case that without significant amount of therapy and communication skills training, it is almost never that a parent is able to listen to the, the bulk of a child's feelings without gaslighting, dismissing them. And it looks like, look on the bright side. Things could be worse. We have things to be grateful for. They're just picking on you because they feel insecure. Those kinds of examples are, are commonplace for most individuals. Not from individuals who came from dramatically traumatized families, but individuals that didn't understand, weren't, it wasn't modeled to them what it was like to hold space for somebody adequately. So those anchor relationships, the biggest contribution to resiliency and well-being in a child is the quality of attachment. And the research is very, very clear on this. It's not the only thing, but it's definitely the biggest contribution that we have anything to do with after the genetics that we, that we, that we donate to the situation. It is our attachment and the number one predictor of, of the quality of attachment is how well we've made sense out of our own childhood. Alice Miller says on page one of the drama of the gifted child, we have only one enduring weapon. We have only one enduring weapon in our fight against mental illness. And that is the discovery of the unique emotional history of our childhood. And the research is cross-cultural. It's cross socio socioeconomic status. It virtually crosses every, every barrier, the quality of attachment, is based on the parent's work, is the greatest contribution we can make to our children. That's why I talk every time on you guys going to and doing your own intensive work. That's the greatest contribution you can make to your healing, to your awareness, to your consciousness, which then is your greatest contribution or leads to your greatest contribution of how well you can hold space and attune to your child. Be there for them. The response by the support system is highly predictive or not of PTSD. Multiple traumas. Remember, when we talk about big T traumas, we also talk about small T traumas. Being dismissed is a small T trauma. And most children on planet Earth experience that on a regular basis. Even if you do a good job in your home, which is rare without a lot of work, it's going to happen at school by the teachers. It's been one of the most difficult parts of parenting this youngest one because of, of our own evolution as a family, not just us parents, but as a family, the discussions we have around trauma and, and, and therapy and feelings and processes. My youngest is incredibly sensitive to adults, authority figures that she encounters every day at school who have varying qualities of what I'm describing today and their ability to support and hold space for a younger person. More subtle and often categorized as small t trauma, process trauma refers to the way in which we were held. It is the quality of the primary attachment figures, which does or does not provide a safe context for feelings to be felt, processed and integrated, no matter how big or small the event. Gabor Monte refers to it as a lack of connection, 
but that can be misleading because people who inadequately respond to the feelings of others, specifically children, often see themselves as very responsive and encouraging, which looks like, quote, helping the other person get over the difficulty. The paradox here is it's in not trying to get the person over the difficulty that you're more capable uh, of supporting them getting through the difficulty. Trying to get them over the difficulty will inevitably, inevitably expose you as somebody who can't hold space for the child. They often see themselves as responsive and encouraging, which looks like helping the other person get over the difficulty. Ironically, process trauma is thought to be created by those who are themselves the victims of such trauma. If you were gaslit, if you were dismissed, if you weren't heard, if you had to get over it, you're likely going to follow that same pattern with your child. You have no model, you have no, no template for listening. Unless you find a therapist who's capable of, of the kind of reparative work that we talk about here. Then over time, especially when you have the courage, like I mentioned on Tuesday night, especially when you have the courage to confront the therapist. And when they respond adequately, compassionately, and even encouraging that you shared something difficult and risky, over time you begin to get a sense of what it means to be a person. And you get a sense of who in your life, who you encounter is or is not maturing. Who is not or who is emotionally mature. Speaking of trauma in the brain, trauma or stress causes the brain to produce neurochemicals, cortisol, and endorphins regulated by the hypothalamus. When creating these chemicals repeatedly over time, the brain can become, we can think of it as addicted to them, desensitized to them, requiring more of them to experience comfort and stimulation. This is why addicts, those who abuse substances or family members in a family where somebody's suffering from addiction are often drawn to drama intensity and fear. Another interesting thing about experiential therapy is this. The brain stores memories in clusters in the brain called cell assemblies. These are interconnected. That's why when you smell a scent, it brings you back to a time where you hear a song and it brings you back to a feeling. That's evidence of these cell assemblies, the, these interconnected sensations, experiences that attach themselves to each other. Everybody's had those kinds of experiences of one sensory event bringing up others. That's why the, the loud bang causes the, the, the war veteran to, to drop to the ground. Because of the way in which memories are triggered by association, an experience like odor, texture, sound, or object, or, or an object reminiscent of any part of the memory stored in the cells of the brain can stimulate associated, associated memories. And also because memories with a high emotional content, pleasant or unpleasant, are more easily recalled by the brain, traumatic memories have a sort of hierarchical power over the less emotionally laden ones. So when you say to somebody who was sexually assaulted, let's say somebody was sexually assaulted by, by a person with a certain profile, let's say a, a, a teacher, and then they develop a fear of other teachers. It's not as simple as saying, well, how many teachers have assaulted you? Of the hundreds that you've experienced, how many have assaulted you? Well, just the one. Well, you see how irrational your fear is? There's no reason to be afraid of teachers at large. That's not the way that the brain works. And because a lot of these, these experiences are, are not necessarily verbal, or happen pre-verbally or pre-conscious, we're not even aware of them. We don't know that we're reacting to things. That's what therapy can teach you. You come to therapy and you tell a story again where you, 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 went, you flew off the handle. You overreacted to a situation. And the therapist gently can help you see the connection. Do you see? I noticed that each time somebody takes credit for an idea or doesn't give you credit for an idea, you feel very threatened and activated. What does that remind you of? What is that an echo of? We take in information through all five senses. Many traumas are pre-verbal experiences that occurred before we learn to express ourselves through speech. It is difficult to reach these wordless places 
and reflect upon them exclusively through the use of language. But when our bodies are engaged, we can move through the memory and show what happened rather than try to reconstruct it with words. That is why an experiential program like ours can be more effective than simple talk therapy. Right? You're, you're in a small group experience, um, which is just a microcosm for your life, for your history. And, and, and while self-report might not give the therapist or, or the parents the professionals working with the child might not give them a clue to what's going on. Observing how they react in this experiential milieu starts to give us a clue. That's why wilderness therapy can be so effective, can be so powerful, both in its discovery of the trauma process, the trauma, and also of the healing of the trauma. Like I mentioned earlier, the, the stage of life Trust versus mistrust, autonomy versus shame and doubt, industry versus inferiority, autonomy versus self-doubt, identity versus identity or moral confusion, and intimacy versus loneliness. All of these stages have specific tasks that the human brain is, is sort of unfolding into. And if trauma and the, the, the connection around the trauma is fractured and affected, it can affect the specific stage. And because a, a, an infant, for example, going through trust and mistrust is so at the mercy of, of those around them, the earlier the, the trauma occurs, the more global and intense and difficult to treat the event can be. So if a child experiences neglect during the first couple of years of life or abuse during the first couple of years of life, that becomes a very difficult, ingrained, hardwired experience in the brain. PTSD has with it intense feelings of fear, powerlessness, helplessness, and horror. And the symptoms range from cutting. Everything is an attempt to not feel to numb. Cutting, eating disorders, substance abuse, far out crazy behavior, attachment symptoms, inability to connect to others. Oppositional diagnoses, identity, role confusion. They become a chameleon. Mimicking abuse. Sometimes they identify with the perpetrator and inflict the same abuse on others. That is a very, very common scenario that plays out. They want to feel the, the, the power in contrast to the powerlessness that they felt during and around the traumatic event. They identify with the perpetrator in that way. Lying and exaggerations. PTSD of all of the mental health diagnoses is the, the broadest in its range. It's, 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 it's revelation. It, it's, it's, it's revealing itself. It can look like many different things, sometimes the opposite. Overstimulation or understimulated. Hypersexual and hyposexual. And you could be talking about the same exact trauma. Its expression is just a stylistic difference. So what's the treatment? For the parent, it is to read, to understand. Go to therapy. Attend support groups in, in an area that, that relates to, to what, we're, what we're talking about or what your child is experiencing. And to really learn to understand the, under, the ununderstandable. To learn to understand the best you can. I said one time in one of my books that to understand somebody truly to understand somebody, you have to lose your mind. And what I'm saying is get out of your perspective. Learn to see things through the other person's eyes. And importantly, like I've talked about lately a couple of times, it's important that we treat the issue and not get distracted by the symptoms because here's the, here's the secret. This is crazy. Symptoms are not only meant to distract the individual who suffers from them, from feeling the authentic pain and suffering, but the symptom is great at distracting everybody else. You know the phrase that you've probably heard that says, the people that lead, need love the most are, are sometimes the hardest to love? That's what that means. Somebody who looks aggressive and violent and reactive and hypersexual and dangerous behavior, 
self-harming, suicidal. All of those symptoms, as Carl Jung explained, all of those symptoms, all of those neurotic behaviors are an attempt to avoid authentic suffering. So the therapist takes the, the individual, the child in this case, or the parent, back to where they were hurt to talk about it, to listen, to explore it, to unravel it, to unpack it. In other words, it gets worse before it gets better, in a sense. And like I said, there, there, there's got to be some art, some balance of treatment that, that happens within the child's time frame, within, within a sense of, of control for the child. And of course, that, that comes with some limits based on how dangerous and acute the symptoms are. From the child's perspective or from the individual that's being treated, you want to empower them. You want to give them a sense of, of, of driving the, the, the bus, if you will toward healing, validating, listening, and understand the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake that most therapists make is confrontation and masters of therapy pride themselves on what they don't say on listening. When I'm listening to a client, I have triggers going off, but, but because of my work, because of my practice, my discipline, and because of my own healing, I can set those reactions aside momentarily. And setting those, those feelings and reactions aside, this is another secret. Setting those aside for an unhealed person feels really triggering. If you haven't processed your trauma, your unspoken, unfelt world, then listening and not talking and not confronting will approximate your original trauma experience. You'll be traumatized. You'll experience a, a post-traumatic stress reaction. We focus on the relationship. We focus on the attachment. Yes, we talk about distortions of thinking, but we wait. We wait till their safety. We want to create a, an approach that's driven, initiated by the therapist. And we want to do all that we can to, to remove the shame. The shame is one of the largest threats to the healing process, which requires the individual to talk about it. You can look at all of the methods that are, that are in the, the, the literature on treating trauma, EMDR, brain body, and, and one thing is common to all of them repeated disclosure, discussing, discussion, and description of the trauma over and over and over again. That is common amongst virtually all of the research supported treatments for trauma. So you listen to it. You try to take a strength-based approach, be respectful not treat them like they're fragile. But then again, you have to work on your own shame, your own triggers, like I mentioned. And understand that every symptom serves a function. That the primary function of the symptom is to distract the, the individual from feeling the pain, the fear, the sadness, the, the powerlessness, the hopelessness, the despair. And, and the secondary function of the symptom is to distract everybody else. If I can get you talking about my weight, if I can get you talking about my, my drug use, if I can get you talking about my, my self-harm, then we don't have to talk about how I'm feeling inside. We don't have to talk about what those symptoms cover up. And then overall, it's a reparative emotional experience. I gave a big plug for experiential therapy earlier, and I believe in it. It's, it's powerful. It's effective at both uncovering and creating a reparative experience. But let me be clear. When you understand how human beings operate, you understand that walking into an office and telling somebody the truth about yourself is an experience itself. And sometimes when people promote experiential activities, they get so interested at their creative process 
and they don't understand that saying something difficult that you could be judged for. See, what the client fears at an unconscious level, if not conscious, is that if I tell you my story, the same thing will happen to me here that has happened to me my whole life. And that is why confronting the therapist, for lack of a better word, telling the therapist difficult things about you and the therapist is the greatest risk. And if the therapist has done their work adequately, they recognize that the moment a, th a client says, I didn't like what you said last week. I didn't like the assignment. I didn't like the way you spoke. I didn't like this word. I'm angry at you. I'm sad with you. If you had an adequate therapist, their response would inevitably be, I'm so glad you talked about it. Thank you for bringing that to me. That's the golden moment. But because most therapists haven't healed, They'll defend themselves. They'll explain why they did it. They'll, they'll even tell the, the, the client how the client misunderstood their intentions. And guess what? That's exactly what the typical parent would do to defend their ego. That's what I've done to my children over the years. Much, much more than I would like to admit. So the reparative emotional experiences is... is, is the therapy that happens in between every moment. There's a quote from Alan on that says, if it's hysterical, it's historical. If the, the response or the reaction to a situation is disproportionate to the present circumstance, it may be tied to some historical event. When you find yourself snapping at your partner or your child and in and, 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 and further reflection, you realize, wow, I overreacted. Or wow, that was a big reaction. You can get really curious at that moment and say, I wonder what this brought up for me. I wonder what this triggered. I wonder what the historical roots are of this reaction. Dysregulation is a, is a, a popular word today in trauma-informed therapy about our inability to maintain a, a calm, open, creative, and clear state of mind. Dysregulation is fear, anger, rage, turmoil, confusion. We talk about it in terms of flipping our lid, which is a wonderful illustration of what happens to the prefrontal cortex, the adult thinking rational part of our brain that goes offline during a traumatic response. The individual becomes reactive versus responsive. Daniel Siegel talks about the high road versus the low road, which is both literal, a reference to the literal parts of the brain, but also has in it the idea of the different value of being able to respond from a grounded place. Controlling dismissive of others, rigid responses and repetitive cycles are all part of a trauma response. Alice Miller said, speaking of the historical versus uh, hysterical, she says, when we then realize that all of our lives we have feared and struggled to ward off something that really cannot happen any longer. It has already happened at the very beginning of our lives while we were completely dependent. And so, so much of our difficulty in relationships, in parenting, in even understanding, even gaining insight is based in our history. And, and when we heal and work through that history, along with getting educated and having a healthy mental health model for us, we can then become more of an agent in our own lives. If you go to tap me on the shoulder because I had been abused by my father growing up and you're a male and I'd been abused by my father and I jerk in reaction, it's not, it's not accurate to say I chose to feel afraid. But it is my fear now. And if I don't do my work around it, it can be said that I'm choosing, I'm choosing to stay afraid. I can also ask you to ask for permission before you touch me. I can share with you what's going on for me. And if I'm not asking you something that's outside of your, your value system, I'm asking for something that's, that's appropriate, you can change your behavior. But our histories are our responsibility. We, we, didn't, we didn't create 
the traumas in our lives, but they are ours now. And if we don't work on them, we will inevitably act them out on our children in ways that we can't possibly imagine until we do the work. So what are the take home? First of all, healing is not about conscious processing. There are implicit memories. There are pre-verbal, non-verbal memories, experiences that we carry around in our bodies, in our nervous system. We talked about the broadening definition of trauma instead of thinking of it as simple or binary or something that everybody can agree on. We've talked about this idea that the symptoms become the voice of our wounds, the expression of our wounds. And to treat the symptoms like we would treat a, 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 um, a headache with aspirin doesn't make sense. We have to understand what brought on that. What it, was it? Dehydration? Was it stress? Was it exposure to, to, to something that caused it? We have to look at that over time. Expanding passion and dampening judgment. Those are the key ingredients in this process. Because those are the biggest barriers to healing, to discussion, to exploring. I always say that one of my favorite preludes to, to something that a client shares is when they say, I know I shouldn't feel this way. I know that this is irrational. And what they're telling me, they're telling me about the way that they've been gaslit in their life. And I know I'm about to hear something important. We have to understand, we have to understand that it is important that the individual in therapy have some decision-making power over their healing process. If we hijack it, because we know what's better for them, because we're the adults, because we're the experts. We are, we are risking the potential of re-traumatizing the individual, even if we say and think that our heart's in the wrong place. PTA, PTSD has many faces. It can look like a lot of things. And through experiential therapy, we can effectively assess and treat trauma. And I love this quote. I'm just going to give it to you again. If it's hysterical, it's, it's historical. It's probably one of the simplest, most applicable tools, ideas that I've ever been taught. And like I said, give the client a, a sense of control over the process. All right. looks like I've gone the full hour. If you want to jump off and go to the parent support group that's, that's being held right now, I believe, feel free to jump off. I'll go over the upcoming events and announcements. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are available on Amazon and Audible. If you want to do a deep dive in your own work, I've been talking about this all night. Our offering is Finding You, a five-day family of origin intensive. September 20th through 24th. Last I checked, we had one spot. We might still have that spot. We also have an online option that happens uh, about once every other month. It is less than half of the time and about a third of the cost and you don't have to travel. So if, if time and finances are, are limited, it is a wonderful option that we started during the pandemic. I was skeptical of, and we saw more. We saw how, how well it could help people. Returning to you is the sequel to finding you. So the next available time frame is March 6th through 10th. It will fill out. It will fill up, excuse me, months in advance. It really will. The October session has been full for a while now. You can get on the waiting list if you'd like to. And then I have a finding connection workshop. This will be four couples in February. So if you want to come and do your work, I'm not talking about high conflict couples, but couples who, who are, 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 are equally yoked, if you will, who are willing to do their, their process in front of their partner, feel safe enough to do the majority of their work in front of their partner. Finding connection workshop is a wonderful, wonderful option. February 7th through 11th. We also have custom finding connection for couples and parents, co-parents and finding family for families, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com for more information. We have the all day workshop, the conscious parenting seminar, which will be held September 29th from 9 30 AM to 4 30 PM mountain time. I'll be hosting that. We're going to keep it small enough. We have a couple of spaces left. We'll keep it small enough so that you can have discussions and it won't just be me lecturing the entire time. Like I mentioned, we have support groups for current and alumni families. Tonight, September 7th at 7 p.m. is that offering. 
The next offering is next week, September 14th at 7 p.m. And once a month, we have an alumni only meeting, September 26th at 6.30 p.m. Next at 6.30 p.m. Mountain Time is the next offering for that. We have an intensives meeting once a month, September 12th at 6 p.m. is that offering. If you want to learn more, go to evoketherapy.com slash family involvement for more information. We have a family trek, which is a multi-day immersive experience in the wilderness with your child. That can be in the middle of the process, the end of the process of wilderness therapy. It can be not even associated with wilderness therapy. It can be used during transitions. If you want an experiential process to experience some of what your child experienced with therapy on top of that, contact admissions at evoketherapy.com to find out more about our family treks. We have virtual coaches that can help you through the, your, your process. They can, they can do it virtually with you. Parents, couples, families, or individuals transitioning home codependency, some of the work that I've talked about tonight of discovering and unraveling your own trauma, contact coaching at evoketherapy.com for more information. We encourage all families to try at least six of the following support groups, any combination of these, alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, or refugerecovery.org. Also, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, is a great place to go with free resources and classes in your local community. All these broadcasts are available on Spotify or your favorite podcast app. Just search Finding You in Evoke Therapy Podcast. Or go to soundcloud.com on your computer and search for Finding You There. You can also watch the rebroadcast, the rebroadcast. The rebroadcast of, uh, of these on, your, on Evoke's YouTube channel. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on Twitter, threads, and Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. You can also find Evoke Intensives on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And of course, our blog has wonderful content each week. If you want to give back for people that can't afford therapy and treatment, the three charitable partners that we work with and donate to are ChooseMentalHealth.org, SkyStheLimitFund.org, or the EvokeFamilyFoundation.org. You can earmark your tax-deductible donation to a specific population or program if that be your desire. All right, folks, my next broadcast will be, actually, I didn't do this right. It's September 12th, I believe. I'll be doing a live Q&A. So if you want to send in questions in advance, if you have questions left over, just email webinar at evoketherapy.com. You can always email us there for questions, suggestions, anything you'd like to communicate to us. September 12th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. I look forward to that. I hope this was a helpful point of contact and helpful information for you. And for and on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thank you for showing up this evening and being willing to do your work. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.